Hello and good evening, everyone. Raquel Batiste here, host of Critica NYC, a show dedicated to discussing the issues, work, and politics of the Latinx community in New York and beyond. Uh, it's been quite a while uh, since we have been all together, and so much has ha happened over the last three weeks. Um, everything from the resignation of Lieutenant Governor Brian Benjamin. Uh, he resigned and was arrested for alleged uh, corruption. Um, and that has led to the governor's race and the Lieutenant Governor's race really heating up. As many of you know, Critica, the last two shows that we had we featured two Latinas that are running for Lieutenant Governor, Ana Maria Archila, who is running with Jumani Williams, and uh, Diana Reina, who is running mate of Tom Swazi. And we had the opportunity to talk with both of them about their backgrounds, about their work over the years in the community, um, on issues of policy, and uh, where they stand currently and the sort of issues that they're looking to move forward if elected as Lieutenant Governor. So there's definitely a lot for us to see, a lot for us to do and to look forward to um, over the next several months. Uh, today, we are um, talking about Latinas who are running for New York State Legislature. And as you know, not only is the governor's race an important one for us to look towards to, but also all over the state, people are running for the state Senate, for the state assembly. These roles um, really are the roles that make up the laws that govern New York state and really impact the policy and also the overall budget of New York state and how it impacts our city. And so today we are joined with Miguelina Camilo and Miguelina is running for the New York State Senate seat um, in the Bronx that covers the areas of Riverdale and Woodlawn and Morris Park. She has a pretty uh, big area that is covered. Um, and let me just tell you a little bit about Miguelina. Miguelina is an attorney uh, she lives here in the Bronx. She is Dominicana. And so we are really excited, especially to have uh, and to see more and more uh, Dominican women running for political office. Most recently, she was an associate counsel to the office of the general counsel for the Board of Elections in the city of New York, uh, where she was charged with enforcing New York election law on all matters related to pursuit of public office. So she is very knowledgeable of that area. Um, prior to that, she was in private practice and also worked at the law office of Murray Richmond in criminal defense. Um, she's done a lot of work on family law and matrimonial matters. She is a seasoned attorney um, and has committed a lot of her work um, and also, you know, doing work with the public, uh, taking leadership within the Dominican Bar Association, the Bronx Women's Bar Association, um, and several other organizations. So I want to welcome Miguelina. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Raquel, for having me on your show. <laughs> Great. So, you know, let's just get started. Why don't you tell us a little bit um, you know, I mentioned a few things about yourself, but I know you have a lot more to share with us. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about you, um, the district that you're you're running for, and you know, why are you running? Sure. So the, my story really is that I was born in the Dominican Republic and came to New York when I was two with my parents. My dad was a small business owner. He had bodegas for most of his life. 
I worked in that bodega while I went to college. I was the first in my family to go to college. Um, and then quickly knew I wanted to be an attorney because the role of a child of an immigrant, an immigrant yourself, I feel like you end up representing people, advocating for people in your community, in your family. So it was something that really was a natural fit for me to be an attorney. Um, and then going on to work from criminal defense to family law, I really continued to see the need for people to be represented. Um, and I was thinking specifically in this past year that I wanted to make a bigger impact and do something more because many times as an advocate, you know, you're working with within the body of law that exists. You can't really go on beyond that. I felt like I could do more. And when this opportunity came to run for office for this district where I have lived throughout the district and know the district have worked there, I live in Riverdale now. I used to live in Throgs Neck, which is the east side of the district. I've worked on uh, the Williamsbridge Williams Road area, which is the east side of the district. And then even at the Board of Elections, working for the board and managing all election events, representing Bronx County. You know, this is just a district that I felt like I could represent well. And here I am running for office. That's excellent. So you're running specifically for Senate District 36. It's the district that was held by um, Senator Alessandra Biagi, who has decided to run for Congress. Um, she's going after the seat that was held by Tom Swazi, who is running for governor. So, um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how it is, you know, you're, you're coming into this um, area where, you know, things have been a little bit contentious in, in these neighborhoods. The, these neighborhoods are ever changing. You are the first Dominican running for this particular seat. Tell us a little bit about um, that experience. So absolutely, it was, you know, an opportunity that opened up almost a domino effect, you know, uh, Senator Biagi deciding to run for Congress, then leaves the seat open with no incumbent. So in an open seat, you know, it is um, attractive to first time candidates, there are other candidates in the race, there will be a primary June 28th. And the district itself does represent, you know, from Riverdale to City Island, um, an interesting district. It is about 43% Latino. Um, so we do have representation here, but we do not have any Latino or Latinas representing us in the from the Bronx in the Senate. Um, so the district is made up of, you know, definitely immigrant communities, um, diverse communities. It's suburban and urban. We have a lot of single family homeowners, uh, but we also have a lot of uh, renters and, you know, um, definitely have uh, a widespread geography that uh, deals with different issues with transportation and, you know, employment, things like that. So the district itself is something that, like I said, through my work in the Bronx and living in the Bronx, I've touched different parts of the district. Um, but I think most important when saying that you want to represent an area, every area wants to be represented. You know, there are a number of different communities that are within the district. And my job is campaigning, making sure that everybody feels like I would represent them individually. And then hopefully if I do become that Senator, of course, taking on the task, you know, fighting for the district and all of the needs of the district. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, and going back to this issue of the diversity of the district, I am also a resident for full disclosure of the district. Um, I live on the Riverdale side and, um, you know, being a Bronx site, right, I was born and raised in the Bronx um, and these particular areas are kind of like an, an aspirational area, right? It was it was a place that I really wanted to live in, you know, coming from different neighborhoods throughout the Bronx, right? It's like, if you if you move to Riverdale, it was kind of like you made it, um, you know, for, you know, me thinking, you know, when I was like a teenager. Um, and I still feel that way. I, I love our neighborhood. It is increasingly more diverse. Um, a lot of the leadership here have traditionally been uh, Jewish, of Jewish background. Um, and so to have, uh, and to see more and more Latinas um, in particular and Dominicanas running for this seat 
because I'm sure of this 43% that are Latino, a grand majority are Dominican, uh, to have someone run. Um, and also the fact, you know, for me, it is also very interesting that, um, you know, the, the leadership in the Bronx has also made the decision to um, endorse a Latina in this seat. Uh, so, you know, I, I congratulate you again, Miguelina. I think it's, it's a huge step forward uh, for our communities, uh, you know, to see uh, people like you um, that have come here, that have progressed, um, that have done a lot to obtain their education, their professionalism to then be able to represent our communities. So, you know, can you talk to me a little bit about the, the issues that you're looking to focus on um, during this campaign? And if you win, you know, what are the major initiatives that you're looking to, to push forward? Sure. So absolutely. Just touching on the last thing you said about getting support from the party um, and the understanding that we're in a wave where we're, more women are running, more Latinos are getting into politics, which is a great thing that I think we're embracing, that that is an ideal way to be civically engaged in your community. So I'm happy to be part of that wave, which I think is what's happening. Um, the issues that are, you know, being faced by every politician and every person running for office um, coming out of COVID and really starting the recovery, you know, COVID itself highlighted so many issues that were already existing in the district. And I like to say that I want to speak from uh, the places that I know, because I cannot pretend that I know everything, you know, uh, while being a politician or stepping into the role of a Senator, I will have to, I'll be tasked in representing the district on a myriad of issues, but uh, as my campaign platform, my speak of where I come from. So small businesses are very important to me and structuring them and, and supporting them in a way that they can outlast, you know, any type of pandemic that may come. Um, that's because of the background of my family and where we come from. Um, education is important to me because funding our schools and providing after school programs and more activities for our kids. I'm very passionate about mentorship because it's something I didn't have during my path. So I always sought out opportunities to be a mentor for others because I know how important that is. And I gained mentors later on in life. And sometimes I think, what would have happened? What more could I have done if I had more resources early on um, while I was growing up and while I had parents and a great supportive family that gave me what they could, but they really couldn't provide for, you know, things that they didn't know about. So mentorship, education, and specifically now, you know, you have a child, people that have children, how are we re-engaging our children, you know, back into their curriculum when they've had this trauma for the last two years of being away from their fellow students, their teachers, not being in person, there's going to be a lot of social adaptation and skills that have to come back. Um, so those are some of the main things that are happening. Um, and then, of course, you know, the goals that also would fulfill um, ideals and things that New York has been working towards. So our environmental policies, lessening our environmental impact. New York is leading that change, making sure that we stay, you know, in the lead of that. Um, and definitely just being a collaborator and working with my colleagues. I am happy that I have so much support from electeds and from the party because I want to be able to walk into Albany and have partnership. Um, I think that's the best way to get things done um, and have a legislator that actually works for the district. Sure. And so you mentioned, right, that your your family owned the bodegas um, here in the Bronx, right? Yes, they had several. So I love to tell the story about the first bodega that my dad and his brothers, my uncles tried to um, get into, was in the Bronx on Morris Avenue. And they were having issues as young Latino men in the 80s getting a loan. And they were able to get assistance from a local attorney who ended up being Murray Richmond, my first boss out of law school. So that was just a contact that Murray was able to make through a phone call, you know, um, and refer my family to this bank. And, you know, they went through the process. And that was the first bodega that my family had. And my dad ended up having several bodegas. The last one being in Harlem, 125th and Broadway, where I worked for a number of years um, on weekends. 
Wow, that's that's amazing. And and what do you feel was, you know, the most challenging part, uh, you know, for your family, for your dad, and even for you, um, being small business owners and 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 having to work, right? You had to work there uh, to make sure that you know it kept operating and doing what it had to do. What was the most challenging part of that experience? I absolutely remember um, specific issues that my dad had to deal with, with just being very hyper aware of licensing issues. So any licensing issues with cigarette sales or alcohol sales, if you were ever to be found that you sold to a minor or had an issue with the city, you know, one fine, two fines can cause your business to close down. You know, the amount of money that these fines could add up to was a really serious thing. And I always saw that while my father luckily was organized enough and ran a steady business, it was a, a daily time, right? 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There was very little downtime and it was really managed by the immediate family, you know, so cousins, uncles, myself, you know, the staff, it, it just didn't give much opportunity to grow, at least not to my fa for my father. Like he provided for us from that business, but it was just a physically, you know, very demanding job and very much, you know, I saw others in the same area that, that would fail because they didn't have, you know, that attention that my dad had to the mandates of the city, increase it in rent. The last store that my uncle had, unfortunately, he had it for over 20 years downtown 34th Street. He had to close it because the rent was astronomical. The building had been sold to the to the city and it was just impossible to meet the rent. I know the, like the community actually demonstrated they didn't want the deli to go away. And my uncle had no, no choice. They wouldn't renew his lease. Um, they wanted an incredibly high rent and that was the last bodega in the family or actually my, one of my other uncles has a bodega still, but that was okay. like the bodega that, you know, my dad was there at, at some point and to see it close, it was a sad thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it is really tough, you know, in, in the current market. And I think after the pandemic, you know, people are still, as you mentioned, we're still recovering. They're still trying to figure out, you know, how to keep their doors open, especially after two years of, you know, insecurity, right? And as much as, um, you know, the city, the state and the federal government has done, uh, there is still so much more uh, to happen. And, uh, you know, this this last uh, budget that was passed, um, there were several issues uh, that came up, right, around um, how do you, uh, you know, support, for example, excluded workers? Um, how do you support small businesses? You know, I would love to hear uh, your thoughts, Miguelina, around how you see um, the state moving forward after this a budget cycle, right? Um, you know, if elected, you'll be a part of, of the next and up and coming conversation. And then most recently, right, we have um, the Amazon workers that just unionized in, in Staten Island. And uh, there's been a wave of unionization with Starbucks, you know, and other industries that also have been heavily impacted by the pandemic. Um, and, you know, would love to hear your thoughts as well on those issues. Well, first on the budget, which I saw, you know, friends that, that are now friends, hopefully future colleagues, you know, go through the very long process of trying to come together and approve a budget that is issued, you know, on the basis of trying to really um, source out, you know, what are the priorities, you know, where do we need the funds to go? And it's a lot of negotiation. Not everybody's going to get what they want. You know, um, many things were left out of the budget that unfortunately was just something that is part of the legislative process. So to me, it was most interesting to see you know, and imagine when that's being played out, you know, how are things being prioritized and not just assigning dollars to a, a, a area, but really the implementation of how is that money going to be used? So, you know, in the platform issues that I have, looking at how much money was put towards education, 
um, the budget for education grows every year. And I hope that it's actually implemented in a way that we are going to see better results from our school. We're going to see our schools get the assistance they need to really wrap their hands around bringing students back in person and, you know, achieve, helping them achieve success. Um, so I, I think, you know, while the nitty gritty specifics of the budget will be something that hopefully I'll get to learn, um, you know, on an intimate level, I think overall it was just seeing that it is um, a difficult process sometimes and that we see certain things are prioritized uh, and it's not always, you know, what you hope is prioritized. Um, so that's just a very general answer to that question on the budget. Um, the other part of your question in dealing with, um, just what was the other part of your question? With uh, workers and excluded workers and the union. The movement around yes. unionization. Yes. So with the unions, it's a terrific, I always say, and you know, part of the political process running for office is seeking endorsement from these unions and talking to them. And that's been my favorite part of running for office because I get to hear directly from these groups that are representing, you know, a lot of our constituents. Um, what their issues are. And for unions, I always think it's such an amazing thing. Like my parents were never part of a union. You know, a lot of our communities um, don't have those benefits and unions really build wealth. You know, they really help people set themselves up for retirement. They set protections for even non-union employees. So I'm happy to see Amazon achieving that task and unionizing because we all know we were ordering Amazon packages during yep. the entire pandemic and they deserve those protections. So I'm a big uh, supporter of unions. Um, I've had several already uh, endorse my race. And to me, that's just another partner that's going to help me. You know, if I do um, make it as senator, um, they are going to be a resource that will help me um, gauge, you know, any legislation that deals with uh, job increases or losses or new projects like unions deserve um, to be at the table is what I always say. Excellent. I mean, you know, it, it really is monumental uh, what's been happening with Amazon. And then, you know, just watching the news, just to like, on a side note, um, that uh, Elon Musk now what, purchased Twitter for $44 billion. Um, and, you know, and, and this does go back, right, to this issue of, of the budget and um, increasing taxes on billionaires and having them uh, pay, pay their fair share. Um, and that's always, right, an, an unending issue uh, that comes up, I think, pretty much every budget cycle is this issue of taxes and how it impacts us. I think that, you know, Latino communities, we don't really engage heavily um, in that particular conversation when it comes to, right, taxes and how those laws, you know, impact our bottom line, right, and how it impacts our communities. And, you know, I, I'm not to say here that, that maybe you're, you know, would love to hear if you have any particular thoughts around that um, specifically, you know, I think that, you know, the district that um, you're looking to represent has so many diverse interests, right? Because um, you have you have the homeowners, you have workers, um, but you also have, right, the landlords and other corporate interests um, like, uh, like hospitals, like Montefiore and other, I, I believe that lay within within this district and would love to hear, you know, your thoughts around that too. I think in speaking about issues like this, like the important thing is representation. And that's why we're happy to see more people that are Latino, more women running, because it, those issues that we're speaking of now only get to Albany if people like us are up there, you know, and can speak from a place of knowing. Um, so when we're talking about, you know, allocation of funds and if we need right to rethink our tax base and how uh, we're dealing with the disparate incomes um, that is something that's going to be voiced by someone that maybe had that experience growing up and had those families in the district um, and I think overall you know my the district will tell me the constituents will tell me uh, where they're suffering and where they need um, to be really 
considered, you know, when legislation is being thought of. Um, and I, I hope to have really an on the ground operation where constituent services is strong and, you know, the staffing of these offices that are representing the Senate, right? The Senate office of the District 36, um, there is a streamlined process for those interests of the constituents to come forward because they're really the ones, you know, they vote you into office and they're the ones that we are accountable to. Great, and so why don't you tell us a, a little bit more about, you know, your most recent experiences. I know that you, um, had worked at the Board of Elections, um, and you were, you know, heavily involved in this whole process, and now you're on the other side, right, running as a candidate. So, uh, you know, how, how has that been, you know, moving into, you know, this side of, of the equation? I mean, it's really been amazing. I think for any professional, any person that sets out on their career path, you must know how important relationships are and how important working hard is. So I think starting as someone that knew I wanted to be an attorney, what really attracted me to that was that I understood that with a law license, I could do many things. And I think for those that us, those of us that enjoy learning, and lawyers, I believe, are part of that. Uh, we like to learn new things. So as a lawyer, I was able to do criminal, family, matrimonial. When I then started doing election law and became more interested in that area, I thought it was just um, you know, very important because our right to vote is one of our most essential rights. Um, and especially in New York City, where we have a different type of voting um, block and we have we represent such a large constituency that votes. Um, it's just something that we have to understand our obligation to protect it. We're being watched you know, by the entire country um, and to feel that importance, right? That this is something that shapes so many other uh, policies. I just really enjoyed learning more about election law. And in that space, you know, just learning from my elected, seeing what the issues were uh, when they were going through election cycles. Um, and then being able to end up as a candidate myself, it was definitely beneficial to understand the process, right? The process of getting on the ballot um, and getting signatures and all those things that are the details that are necessary to run for office. Um, it's something that you could teach a whole course on. And I believe Raquel, you know that well. You know? <laughs> that is really essential um, to know. And I think more people uh, should speak about that, you know, and, and share that information with those because it really just takes a passion for your community. If you are a person that thinks of others and really cares about what's going on in general to like, you know, people around you, um, then elected office can be something you consider and learning the ropes of, you know, actually running a campaign and getting on the ballot, people can share that information and it would truly be beneficial to have more people interested in running. Yeah, no, and, and thank you so much for saying all of those things, Miguelina, because I think, you know, what we've been witnessing, you know, over the last several years, right, is just how important it is to be involved in public life and to be civically engaged, um, not only as people coming out to vote, Right. But also, you know, making the decision to run, whether it's for, you know, your school board, your school leadership team, for city council, the Senate, you know, whatever it is. Right. Because, you know, we bring a, a different voice, a different vision, um, different issues. We articulate things that maybe another person could not, you know, and it is just so important. You know, and, and even, you know, as attorneys, right? So, you know, we've all been watching. I know I was watching very closely the Senate confirmation hearings for Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. And, um, you know, just watching, you know, what she was going through, right? To be able to uh, be confirmed. And we're all looking forward to her being sworn in in the summer to become our next justice and the first African-American woman ever to be on the Supreme Court, which is really amazing. I mean, you know, we just have to go through so much to get to 
where we are. Um, and, you know, and there were moments where I too wanted to just cry for her, just listening to um, the other uh, representatives, you know, asking questions or not really asking questions, but stating their case and talking about their issues that maybe had really nothing to do with her confirmation process. Um, but, you know, would love to also hear from you, you know, your thoughts about that, you know, now that you have thrown your hat in the ring um, and seeing other women as they advance uh, within public life and civic life, you know what it takes, right, to, to make it through. Right. I mean, we are living through historical times, you know, Justice Jackson being the first um, Black woman to make it to the Supreme Court, living through that moment in 2022, talking about first. It's just something that is so incredible. Um, and I loved seeing how poised she was. And I think it's just when you're overqualified for something, that's all chatter. You know, it, it was terrible to have to see it and it played out on national television and she just stood her ground. And it was, you know, for us who know the truth and know how her qualifications even you know, compare to the other sitting justices, um, you you had to feel it for her, right? Like how difficult that must have been, but she really just had to kind of stand in her moment because she had everything that we could hope for to have in a, a Supreme Court justice. So that's just one thing to say that, you know, to, to get to see that and to get to see those moments really inspires me. Uh, I was celebrating in my role as Bronx Women's Bar was celebrating the first. Like that's the actual theme I came up with uh, for this past year. Let's celebrate all the first. We have the first African-American district attorney in the Bronx. She is the first one we featured, right? We have the first African-American administrative judge in criminal court in the Bronx. Uh, we have the first Latina and first female um, for the Bronx Chamber of Commerce. Um, these are firsts that are all around us, and again, in the year 2022, but to celebrate them because they really are shattering that glass ceiling and creating that space for the next person. And I think, you know, we have to be inspired by people that are doing that, and we have to expect those people that are being those firsts to make sure that they're not the last and to make sure that they're bringing others with them, um, seeking to mentor that next person. I think that's something crucial that's about uh, any type of position of power that you hold. And I'll say as elected office, you want to be thinking, you know, I'm, I'm going to be grooming my successor on day one, right? Because you cannot be alone in this fight. Um, if I get to be that first Latina senator, you can guarantee that I'm going to make sure to be looking for the next one after me. That's great, you know, and that's that's really remarkable, you know, because we one we don't really hear that from yeah. a lot of our leadership, you know, and and I'm and not even just you know our electeds, but you know our civic leaders, whether it's a, within the nonprofit sector, business leaders you know, just the importance of planning and succession, but also, you know, and I, and I love that point that you bring up of the first, right? And what it takes uh, to become the first, to carve out that path and hopefully making it a, be, a bit easier for the next ones that come along. Uh, but, you know, within the theme of that, right? Then we see, you know, how these firsts really impact um, decisions that, that are made, right? And so we're, we're talking specifically about the Supreme Court. And recently, the Supreme Court uh, had a ruling which impacted Puerto Rico, uh, where they stated that uh, Puerto Ricans who live in Puerto Rico are not eligible to apply and receive a certain federal benefits, um, such as SSI and others. And um, that decision came down eight to one. And the one person who dissented was Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who is the only Latina, the first Latina ever on the Supreme Court. Uh, she comes from New York. Uh, she served in the Second Circuit. And, um, you know, she really came out saying 
that uh, Puerto Ricans should be protected under the Equal Protection Clause. Now we can go into a lot of technicalities here, me and Miguelina, around um, you know that is that issue because that was a big issue that came up during Katanji Brown Jackson's confirmation hearing, right? Mm -hmm. Where you have the rad the right really attacking the concept of the equal protection clause. Uh, so you know, Miguelina, what you know, what, what are your thoughts around that in particular? You know, I, I I'm hoping that we see. Congress really coming out and legislating on this issue, right? It seems like that's the only path at this point. Um, but, you know, we know, right, in, in New York, we've always done a lot to protect um, our most vulnerable uh, populations and making sure that people are getting the assistance they need, um, but would love to hear, you know, your thoughts on it. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's just when you see our highest court fail in a way, right? And and they, we have certain representation in that court that we expect these results sometimes. Um, and that is a system that we have. You know, we understand that judges are going to have a leaning, a uh, political leaning in a way, although their jobs are to partially, you know, in follow the law. Um, it's still the construct that we live in, right? We have the judicial branch and the executive branch, the legislative branch, um, and we're all supposed to balance each other out. So uh, government is a living, breathing thing. It's constantly changing. Um, it's constantly having to adapt to the needs of the public. And I think that our Congress having the representation that it has, and let's hope that we keep, you know, the the majority that we have and the representation that for those people that can follow through with the essence of the equal protection clause, um, we we hope to do better. Um, I think that the idea that we have elected, we have a system where there's turnaround, there's term limits, um, there's, you know, not always term limits, but there's people mm -hmm. that we have <laughs> uh, that fluid. Um, process right as a civic society that we have uh the ability always to represent those interests as they change you know with our society i think that that's the fight right we want people in office that will be able to communicate those interests um and when we see lone people that are dissenting or that are outcasts they're representing that struggle right that change that we don't have the support for yet but maybe we will have you know, in the future. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that, um, you know, it, it, it it's so tough, right? Because people say, you know, oh, we, let's just follow the law, what's on the paper. But we know, right, that it's, it is a little bit more complicated than just what's on the four corners. And um, there are these competing, um, you know, interests, political thought, um, what people are really looking to gain, right, as we're moving along. And, uh, you know, as we're seeing in, in this country and, and even all around the world, right, we're seeing, um, you know, laws such as, uh, you know, things where they're looking to take away the, a woman's right to, to an abortion, where there's these anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ+, plus sort of laws happening in places like in Florida and Tennessee and Texas and in other places. And, you know, and I always thank God every day that I live in New York, right? Because New York is very different, but it doesn't mean that we're not susceptible to something happening, right? Of, of, that, of that level. And so, you know, which is why it's so important as we're looking at candidates like you, Miguelina, um, you know, just really knowing like where, where people stand on these issues, um, how it's going to impact our communities on a day-to-day -day basis. And would love to hear from you, like, how, how do you see this panorama playing out, especially where now, you know, I don't know if we've moved out of, out of the pandemic yet. We have not really moved out yet. We're still very much in it. Um, and then to be in this situation and then seeing these sort of laws 
coming up all over the country. Right. I mean, I so I'm running as a Democrat, right? This is the Democratic primary that we will have June 28th. Um, and while um, our democratic values are one of equality, right, um, there is um, the constant push that is needed uh, to represent, make sure that equality is representing what the community actually is right now. Um, so, of course, while we are lucky to be in New York, it, we still have to be vigilant of, um, you know, what's going on throughout the country and not just with, you know, reproductive rights, which we're all kind of terrified and watching of what can happen with Roe v. Wade and, you know, on many levels seeking to protect that as much as we can. Um, and it's quite alarming that you could step out of New York and just have a totally different experience. Um, so it is incumbent on the people in power. And I certainly as, a uh, a senator, hopefully, will make sure to protect those interests that I represent as a person, right? I'm a woman. I want to represent uh, protection for reproductive rights. I, you know, want to represent re uh, protection for our LGBTQ plus community or people with disabilities, our most vulnerable, you know, that um, in the at true essence of being a Democrat, right? fighting for that equality of those marginalized communities that as an immigrant, I think you really represent, you know, many of those communities um, and understanding what it can be to be an outcast, right? Or to be a person that um, for some reason is told that you don't have the same rights or benefits as another. Um, so as a candidate, I do represent and want to be that voice uh, for those communities that make up the fabric of, New York, right, of our entire U.S., but especially in the city of New York, where you are more than anywhere else in the country in constant, you know, circles that with people that are different from you, different backgrounds, different uh, set of values even. Um, and we all live together. We all find a way to live together. Um, and it's our job as legislators to make sure that the laws are representing that and protective of everyone. Thank you for that, Miguelina. Look, I think, you know, it's it, it's a tough job. It's it's not an easy one, right? And um, you know, it's 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 one where you need, you know, you know, I definitely love to see, you know, strong women who have strong discernment, who um, you know, they're just ready, right, for for this moment. And I absolutely think that that you are um you know embodying all of uh, all of that you know to move forward through this campaign um and so you know i think you know we have we have a, a little bit of time miguelina and i would love to just hear a little bit more about um your you know your your background you know i think we, we did talk about the fact that you know you're you come from a bodega family you know you came from the dominican republic you, um, you know, you went to law school, you've been in practice, uh, but would love to hear a little bit more about, you know, the work you've done, for example, with the Dominican Bar Association, right? We've been talking a lot about the law here. Um, and I know that you were really at the leadership level of the Dominican Bar and really brought it to a new level of visibility and of engagement, um, not only with Dominican attorneys, but with the community at large. And, um, you know, and I know you've been doing a ton of work with Bronx women as well, which is really, really fantastic. And would love to just hear a little bit more about, about that work that you've been doing. Sure. So I, I think it's important to take on leadership roles, um, especially in spaces where you've benefited. You know, so I benefited from having so many attorneys, um, Dominican attorneys that were helpful to me just because I was part of, you know, um, their community. I was Dominican. That was something that connected us um, and it connected me to the Dominican Bar Association early on, you know, upon graduating from law school. So. Um, being in those in that space where I saw seasoned attorneys that were successful um, and you know were able to reach out and just kind of guide me in a way 
led me to know that I needed to be that for somebody else. So uh, being president of the Dominican Bar Association, you know, one of the key things that we do is we give out scholarships to law students. So how important are scholarships, right? Because coming from a family that had absolutely no idea how to navigate financial aid or even understand what um, financial assistance programs could be out there, that was really what drew me to the Dominican bar to think that we could be a part of helping other other people get to law school. Um, and then, of course, celebrating our Dominican judges, our Dominican attorneys, you know, people in the community that were doing their best to make sure make sure we were represented in a legal field where we all still don't have much representation. And I'm not just talking about, you know, a Dominican background. I'm talking about females and women attorneys in general. You know, we are a lesser number. And um, that is just part of the work. And it was something that gave me so much, you know, being in those leadership roles. I think people really need to embrace taking on such roles because they should know how much it will in do for them in return. So having my name, you know, as the president of the Dominican bar, it hel helps me have that platform. I made connections with, you know, even electeds in the Dominican Republic, um, with other law students, with other people that then we speak about job opportunities and just uh, connectors, you know, way to have more information. And the same with Bronx women's bar, you know, practicing in the Bronx County exclusively, having a practice there, connecting with the judges in Bronx County. It was, again, another opportunity to have a platform, being the president of the Bronx Women's Bar and doing the same for our young attorneys or even attorneys that have just, just not been as involved and need a leader, you know, need someone to kind of inspire um, that type of um, involvement in your community. You know, the, the legal community you we know is very social. Um, it's based on apprenticeship. You know, you learn from each other. Um, and that is very much the type of person I am, you know, just being a social person and understanding the value of relationships. You know, even now running my campaign, people from high school, law school, college are coming back to support me, you know, because I've built those bridges. I've built those connections and people you know, want to be supportive, you know, believe in me. And, and that's something I've built over time. Um, and it's a, a beautiful thing to see it come together now when I'm on this new path and, you know, a new possibility to reach another platform. Um, and I think it's just a great thing to, to be involved um, as much as you can uh, and give back as much as you can. Yeah, no. And, and you brought up that point that, I believe it's like 2% of attorneys are Latino or Latina, uh, which is like, you know, zero, you know, it's almost 0%. I mean, it's a very, very low number. And, uh, you know, the, the importance of, you know, creating the space, right, for people like us to come together who are attorneys to talk about the issues that are impacting, you know, our community specifically, um, and being able to access all, all of their, you know, different resources, but also, yes, as you mentioned, the importance of creating those relationships, right? Creating the relationship with the judges, you know, um, elected officials, all of those, you know, important gatekeepers, right? All the people who, you know, have the key to, you know, getting access to whether it's to, to a person or to funding or whatever, whatever that is. And it just really is so important. And I think, you know, given the history of, of the Dominican Bar Association, it really has come a long way, you know, over the years, right? Because I think that initially when it was founded, it was very much centered around, um, Dominican attorneys that had immigrated to New York who were practicing in the Dominican Republic and now they find themselves here and you know looking at how to they could continue advancing within their legal legal careers which can really be challenging right if there's the language barrier right and I think that some things have come up along the way to allow people to continue practicing in, in different ways if they're partnering up with with a US-based attorney and, and that sort of thing. 
But now that it has evolved over the years to now really incorporate Dominican attorneys, U.S. licensed attorneys that are here in the United States of Dominican backgrounds to really, you know, be engaged. I think that that's, you know, also a testament to your leadership, right, to be able to continue that work, to evolve that work and to very much bring in a lot of the, the new leadership uh, that we've seen over the last several years, you know, after you were president, right? There there have been two or three other women that have taken on, on those roles. Um, and so I also see that as a testament to, to your leadership and the work that you've been doing over the years. Thank you, I appreciate that. I, I wanna say that in that, um, speaking about that struggle that I still see where a lot of our um, community that immigrates from the Dominican Republic who are professionals back home, our doctors, our lawyers, our dentists, and then they come to the US and it's like, they're nobody, right? They're, they're coming here and they don't have the credentials. They have to go through schooling again and maybe don't have those resources. That was, that's the crux of how the Dominican bar really got founded to alleviate that in a way and create for themselves that system of support. Um, and that is something that we see, I think, particularly in the Latino communities, that we sometimes don't seek those resources. You know, we at home may have the means to provide for education and establish ourselves. And what a sad thing it is that you come to this country and you don't, con you know, you just don't have the way to translate it here. Um, so it's something that is very important to support our foreign uh, attorneys. Um, I know that that is definitely part of the work that the DBA has continued to do. And, you know, on that last part, uh, the last thing we were saying about succession planning, and making sure that you're creating that future leadership, I'm happy to say that the DBA now has propelled and done extraordinary work and they have their next three presidents already set out, you know, and the, they're young people that have been involved, care about the organization and have committed themselves, you know, to being those future presidents. So that is the best thing that any past president can see, right? That the organization is doing even better than when you were there. Um, and just very proud of them. That's great. That's great. Um, and then, you know, on our, on our last few minutes, um, Miguelina, is there anything in particular that you want to make sure that gets said, we have five minutes, um, that we talk about in terms of you, your campaign, your running? Um, you know, we know that right at the state level right now, there there is no, in the state Senate specifically, we do not have a Dominican representing um, at the at the Senate level, we do have in the Assembly, mm -hmm. um, and there is an event coming up soon. Dominicans in Albany, I saw that announced as well, coming up soon. We have had state senators in the past. Um, uh, Congressman Adriano Espaillat was a state senator. Marisol Alcantara was a state senator. Um, Jose Peralta, may he rest in peace, uh, was also a state senator representing from uh, Queens. Um, and then, you know, reg regrettably after his death, we haven't had um, anyone representing from the Dominican community at the state Senate level. Um, and so being able to see, you know, potentially you and your win, that would mean that we reestablish ourselves as a community at the state level, um, and, and that would be a, a big win, I think, for our community. Absolutely. I, I, it's something that, you know, running for office is not some, is not a light decision. Although I do like to say the story because many times you will hear women are asked to run. Uh, you're sometimes asked, you know, do you want to run for office? And you will ask them three times or more before they say yes. So my story is when I was asked to run, I said yes immediately because I just felt like I was preparing myself for that next big step. And I wasn't sure when it would happen, but um, the work that I was already doing was going to feed into hopefully, you know, having a strong base as a candidate, as someone that cares about the community, has those uh, relationships, has the base of support. 
and really, you know, is just willing to take on the task, you know, taking on the task of running for office. As a legislator, I would be representing the district, traveling to Albany, which is where, you know, our capital is and where legislation and the actual work would take place, and then representing the district offices back home. Um, it is a, a huge task to take that on. And it's something that I believe when you make that decision, and I said yes immediately, is because I knew I could give that of myself. Um, and it's you have to give yourself fully, you know, and, and really be able to put the people first. And I don't say that just to say it, you know, I, I don't want to sound like someone who's just selling a dream right now. Um, it is my record. It is who I've been. It's who I've been as a person, you know, coming from the background that I come from. Um, just that innate, you know, understanding that and empathy for people. And that's the best way to rule, I think. And the best way to really lead is when you are leading those people and serving the people that you where you come from. Um, so that's really, I feel, uh, who I am um, and who I would want to show the district, you know, that that's who I'm going to be. Um, just a person that is going to be in tune as best as they can with all the different issues, all the different um, people that are part of this great district. Excellent. So Miguelina, where can people contact you and your campaign if they're interested in learning more about you? Yeah, so we have our website, Miguelina Camilo for NY.us, and the Instagram at Camilo for New York uh, or for NY. You can see all my updates, all my information. We have events coming up throughout the district, um, and we will definitely be hoping to see everybody June 28th. That is the primary date uh, for our elections in New York. Um, my whole team is going out throughout the district, making sure we get the word out and that people know how important their vote is and that their vote is what matters June 28th. Excellent. Well, again, Miguelina, thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank again, all of our viewers for tuning in today to Critica NYC. Thank you to our amazing staff, Senaida Mendez, executive producer, Freddie and Carla, who have been doing a ton of work and helping to put our shows together. Again, thank you uh, for joining us here at Critica NYC, where our uh, purpose and our vision is to uh, discuss the issues that are impacting the Latino community throughout New York City and New York State and beyond, and to continue to highlight the amazing leaders that are up and coming in our community. Thank you again for joining us. Every election, there's all this whining. Kids hollering about the environment. About jobs. <laughs> Health care. People don't know what real problems are. Like, you know, thugs and looters. And preserving our heritage. I'm just saying what everyone's thinking. And all, all voting. I'll be voting. You know I'm voting.